open in prayer tonight. Father, we pray for Carrie John, uh, who apparently has pneumonia and is returning uh, to Prescott. And we pray for that trip. We pray for healing for her. And we pray that she is kept safe and sound and comfortable during that trip. And we pray for a, a very speedy recovery for her. As we approach the scriptures for our second session, we thank you for the enlightenment we have received from the first session. We ask that God the Holy Spirit would build on that during our remaining time together tonight. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, in Matthew chapter 28, remember uh, just a, a few remarks that I mentioned previously. Matthew's, Matthew's gospel is centered on the prophesied earthly, political, national, and spiritual kingdom described uh, in the prophetic word. And this term that was used by the Lord Jesus Christ and quoted by him as using this phrase uh, over 30 times by Matthew is a phrase which has its basis in Daniel chapter 2. And you can turn there with me if you like. Hold your place in uh, Matthew 28. But if you would like to turn, turn to Daniel chapter 2 with me. And in Daniel chapter 2, and I'm just going to take one verse. This was uh, when Daniel was concluding the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's multimetallic uh, image in his dream. The, the four uh, phases of this that extend into the revived Roman Empire uh, that, of course, uh, began with the Chaldean Empire and then went to the Medo-Persian Empire, then uh, to the Grecian Empire, then to the Roman Empire, and extends into the revived Roman Empire, which will be very much the uh, control base of the one world economic and religious uh, and political system of Daniel's 70th week. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Daniel speaking, of course, through the inspiration of the Lord. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will itself endure forever. Now Daniel was speaking to the fact that this prophesied kingdom that uh, we know will, will begin with Christ's second advent, this kingdom is going to put an end to all other kingdoms of the world. And he was saying 
the kingdoms that uh, he had mentioned, but nevertheless, those four kingdoms all have vestiges or all uh, have lived vicariously through the through all of the kingdoms of the world, all of the powerful kingdoms of the world throughout uh, human history since the time of the Chaldean Empire. And the kingdoms of the world are going to be crushed by this kingdom which will be established by the God of heaven, the God of heaven in Daniel 2.44. Let's look at it again. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a king which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. If you're thinking, well, it's supposed to only endure for a thousand years, think again, because that kingdom is simply going to uh, go into another phase, a modified phase, and it's going to extend forever. And no other kingdom will ever uh, will ever be victorious over it. So if you go back to Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, let's concentrate for a moment on verse 18, Matthew 28, verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, what is this authority? Because Jesus said uh, that at that time it had been given to him. So he had the authority. All authority in heaven and on earth as he was giving this commission. What does that authority include? That authority includes in a hundred uh, uh, Psalm 110 verse one, the enemies of Christ being made his footstool. So that authority includes his reign as David's descendant from Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. So the authority had been given to him. He had the authority as he was speaking. The authority had been vested in him upon his going to the cross uh, paying the penalty for our sins and for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2.2, 2, and his resurrection from the dead. And he, he was vindicated by, the, uh, by his resurrection from the dead and received this authority. You can read all about it in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it goes into the emptying of himself to go to the cross and then up to his 
earned glory after uh, the cross and after his sacrifice had been accepted by God the Father. So he had the authority when he spoke this commission to him. Why didn't he just use the authority then and wind up the uh, wind up the prophetic calendar with the, the uh, with Ezekiel thirty seven, thirty eight, thirty nine, with uh, portions from Zechariah, with uh, with Christ's declaration in the Olivet Discourse with uh, all these things that are going to happen and result in the God from heaven, Daniel 2, 44, setting up his kingdom on the earth. Well, he had his reasons not to use that authority. And he knew that though the kingdom would be offered to Israel, it would be rejected by Israel. And we'll be going through this, some of it tonight, no doubt some of it next week, so I can get you out of here on time. But there was a reason he didn't exercise that authority. And he currently possesses that same authority presently in his session at the right hand of God the Father, where he will be sitting until his enemies are made his footstool when he will exercise that authority. He is presently, as uh, one person I used to read put it, a king in exile. And I believe that is an apt way to describe the present session of Jesus Christ uh, if we understand that his exile is a willing exile. It's not because he has been forced to do so. So, let's move on then to verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who were they to go to? Nations or people groups. As distinguished from individuals. Of course, individuals were in those people groups, but it was a, uh, it was a mission to the nations. Just as in Matthew 24, verse 13, the gos or uh, verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached as a testimony to all of the nations, and then the end will come. That's going to happen during Daniel's 70th week the gospel of the kingdom is going to resume during that time. We do not proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. We speak the truth about it. It is coming. But the gospel we proclaim during this present dispensation is the information of reconciliation, the information that Christ died on the cross for every individual human being and that uh, you as an individual and 
you as an individual and you over there as an individual. I'm not pointing to people in in the room tonight who are believers, but uh, I'm saying we look at the world. We are we are controlled by the love of Christ. Second Corinthians five fourteen. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all were dead in the spiritual death that Adam plummeted into through the original sin. So that's what motivates us, and it motivates us to recognize every individual as a candidate for salvation. Romans 1.14, the Jew, the Greek, the, the educated, the uneducated, And we, and th- that's our perspective. So it isn't a f- uh, it isn't the kingdom program through which the Gentile nations and individuals in those nations, of course, will be blessed by God through God's uh, bringing Israel into Israel's glory and prominence. But we look at things from a different perspective. We look at every individual as a candidate for the gospel. And some people are called to go out on the mission fields in foreign nations and proclaim the gospel. And they usually do it to both individuals and to large people groups in those nations, large gatherings. And we are to look at it as going in our ambassadorship primarily to individuals or perhaps groups of individuals uh, uh, on the the street corner or whatever, teenagers or or, uh, adults, whoever. But people of all ages, we reach them in all different ways. But we look at every individual as a candidate for the gospel. We look at the at when we're getting out of our car uh, in, a, in a parking lot or, or down at, at the uh, courthouse square or whatever, and somebody else is getting out of their car, we look at them as an individual who is a candidate for the gospel if they don't already know the Lord Jesus Christ. So, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the age. Well, let's talk about this baptizing thing. This is water baptism, I have heard uh, I, I've heard good dispensationalist teachers say that no, th- this is not water baptism. This is uh, this refers to baptism into Christ's body, uh, which is pretty amazing because Christ's body hadn't been uh, spoken about till years after. These instructions were given, but uh, we don't have to. We don't. We don't have to get into that. But uh, let suffice it to say that this is water baptism, because that's the baptism that was the the common usage for the word was what was understood by Christ's disciples when they were water baptized and when the people were water baptized throughout Christ's ministry, throughout their ministry, and into the Pentecostal era. And in fact, uh, 
it was a continuation of John's baptism. The only difference being, and a very significant difference, but the difference being that Christ now had been given all authority because he had gone to the Christ, he had gone to the cross, paid for our sins, rose from the dead, and was what uh, was entitled to receive his kingdom. When Saul of Tarsus was water baptized. And he was, and it was uh, completely appropriate that he was because he was, he was saved while the kingdom program was still underway. And he was, uh, so he, in order to comply with the dispensation under which he was saved, uh, he, he was ordered to be water baptized through a man named, or by a man named Ananias. And like the baptism of John the baptizer, in Acts 22 verse 16, when Paul testified of his water baptism, which had happened earlier in Acts, but he was telling the story about it. Acts twenty two sixteen. Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus was was ordered to get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name. The same purpose for Paul's water baptism was the same purpose as the baptism under John. It was an illustration of Israel's preparation for Messiah to return to set up his kingdom. What Water never washed away the sins of anyone. But you need to understand, there was much illustration in the Old Testament and right up on through the, the, the Pentecostal era. You, you had the, the uh, construction of the tabernacle, the furniture of the tabernacle, the, the uh, sacrificial ritual system. I mean, all these things were illustrations. And the... And, the actual sacrifice of the animals was not what propitiated God the Father. The writer of Hebrews states that. What propitiated or satisfied the righteousness and justice of God the Father was the fact that his son was going to go to the cross and pay for the penalty of pay the penalty for all of the sins of the entire human race from Adam's original sin up on through future sins which will be committed by uh, some who have yet mortal bodies during the millennial reign of Christ. And so it was illustration the wash the water didn't do a thing but the command was there and the association of water in the baptism process was the washing away of sins and it is tragic that there is so much confusion over this in the body of Christ today, in various Christian denominations, in their official doctrine and statements of faith, among uh, evangelical associations and non-denominational 
assemblies and affiliations. It is tragic that there is confusion over, number one, who is to be water baptized? Is it to be infants? Or is it to be professing believers? And then, uh, number two, how are they to be baptized? Is it to be, are they to be sprinkled with a little water? Are they to be immersed, have their total bodies immersed? Or is it to be a fusion, that is, the uh, water being poured over them, which the best evidence points to that's how it was done under John and the, and the, the water baptisms that followed in the Old Testament. It wasn't immersion. But it was, they, they, uh, they stood in the water and water was poured over them. Now, that's not a point I argue over, and that's not a point of which I'm certain, but that's, that's what the best evidence points to. But then that gets into what does water baptism actually mean? Does regeneration actually occur at water baptism? And there are denominations who believe it does, and churches who believe it does. Both churches who believe in infant water baptism and in water baptism uh, of believers who have professed their faith in Christ. There are those who believe that regeneration comes through, that, that still believe that regeneration comes through water baptism. How pathetic is that? And then there are others who mistakenly assume, and this is, I think, this is one of the more benign misunderstandings of water baptism, but, but nevertheless, let's, let's deal with it squarely, because there are those, many of them, uh, with sound dispensational teaching, for much of their ministry or service, but there are those who teach that after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, water baptism was used by believers as a symbol, and there are those who... Most Christians still teach water baptism today, and they still teach this today. There are some who know, who believe no, that water baptism is no longer relevant today, but they do believe that in the Acts period it was used to illustrate the believer's union with Christ into Christ's death into the water. Great. Uh, Christ's death and resurrection and a believer entering into identification with that. I might think, uh, uh, I might come up with something like water baptism. What a great illustration. It's a great illustration. The only thing is, it is not a biblical illustration. Nowhere in the Bible was water baptism ever associated with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, or a believer's identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? Are believers <clears throat> identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? And are they baptized into Christ, in fact, clothed with Christ, in that baptism, yes, affirmative. But 
Was water baptism ever used in the Bible? I have to calm down so my voice doesn't doesn't squeak. So I, I calm down. We need a uh, we need a dial on here that that checks my beats per minute and my blood pressure. Two dials, blood pressure, beats per minute. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does water baptism by immersion, if it was ever even done that way, no long, nowhere is it stated to be an illustration of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and the believer's union with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. A nice illustration it would be, but in the Bible... Water baptism is always associated with the preparation of Israel for Messiah to come and set up his kingdom. And it was always associated with repentance and the washing away of sins. And so, moving on then, verse 20, teaching them, that is the nations, which of course is the people in the nations, but going to them as nations, recognizing the nations, I believe uh, they're very well may be a revival of national tongues during Daniel's 70th week when the gospel will go, Matthew 1.14, will uh, go forth into the entire world as a witness to all the nations before the end comes. How will that be possible uh, through a a small nucleus of 144,000 and then those who are uh, saved through them during such a short period of time? uh, I believe that very likely national tongues, which came at Pentecost, are going to be used for the same purpose, to... to, uh, advance the gospel of the kingdom to the nations. But the end of the age, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ would be with them, as I stated last week. How? In bodily form? No, he is presently at the right hand of the Father and, and will be until his return. But in power and authority, yes. And there is even a a, a means stated in the New Testament by which that's going to happen. And that's in another section of the New Testament, of the Gospels, uh, that is is, uh, stated to be part of the Great Commission. These different references, by the way, uh, and this is in Luke 24. Let's turn there briefly before we close in prayer. Uh, Mark 16, verses in Mark 16, I, I don't have all the specific verses memorized in all these portions, but Mark 16, Luke 24, Matthew 28, and Acts chapter 1, specifically Acts 1, 6. These are are considered to be part and parcel of the Great Commission or by some, some of the some of the passages are considered to be concluded in the Great Commission. Others are not. Uh, that, that's another thing they argue about. But in Luke chapter 24, 
here's what I want to get across in closing. And that, uh, that I'm not going to have time to do. So uh, we'll pick it up with a, next week with a very, very brief encapsulation of the Great Commission given in Matthew 28. And then we'll move on to the means in Luke 24 by which Jesus would be with his disciples until the end of the age. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for the grace that you have shown us and the comfort you have given us as you have shown us how some of these pieces of the puzzle fit together and just confirm the reality of God's plan yet to be gloriously fulfilled for Israel and God's plan for all believers as individuals. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.